welcome to James McGinty's workshop. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm John Cox, and I'll be introducing James this morning. Um, I guess like quite a lot of you, we've all known James for a long time. And in fact, we used James at our Lincolnshire Charter celebrations um, earlier in the year, or no, late last year. Um, the other thing is that if you, if you ever remember James's speech, A Girl on a Train, or something to that effect, I think, um, every time I get on a train now and go to the loo, yeah. I'm expecting the door to open and a lovely lady to be sat there. On. But no such luck. Let me just tell you a little bit about James. He's a, a multi-award winning international speaker who's been involved in public speaking and training for well over 25 years. Um, as well as being a renowned competitive speaker, with no fewer than 17 Toastmasters District 71 final appearances, uh, resulting in four wins and several podium finishes, James works as a professional speaker and coach. Um, his workshop this morning is all about coming up with an answer to any topic. He delights in tackling the most difficult table topics, and this year he's going to share his, or today he's going to share his secret of tackling a topic at any time. So please welcome James McGinty. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Now, what I'm supposed to do next is say that was terrible and get you to do it again, but it was wonderful. <laughs> and people have been coming up to me since I got here yesterday and saying, Oh, your workshop tomorrow is going to be terrific. So if it's not, it's your fault. <laughs> and you have to understand that. I'm really, really looking forward to this because I've not seen it either. <laughs> the finishing touches were put to this at five o'clock yesterday morning on a rather stormy sea between uh, Stranraer and Larn. So, and I've not had time to go back over it because we're at conference and we're having a ball. But this is about topics for the terrified. Who gets really anxious when the topic session starts? Yeah. Look at those hands. Yeah. There are people in this room that know the number of flowers on the wallpaper, <laughs> the number of lines in the carpet, and how far they can see out the window. But can't remember what the topics master was wearing. <laughs> Because as soon as the Topics Master gets up... <laughs> don't, 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 don't pick me. I used to be like, get down a lot further. <laughs> and there's absolutely no reason to feel that way. Because the one thing about Toastmasters is it's a safe place to fail. Who saw me? at the last international speech contest fail spectacularly on stage and break down into tears and walk off in the middle of a district final. I'm still alive. <laughs> I didn't die. Yeah. Somebody else did. I, I took it out somewhere. <laughs> because you do have to have somewhere to vent your frustrations, and that's really, really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't let this like niceness that we all share get in the way you know, of venting your feelings. I live in a flat now. I've got nowhere to build the bo to bury the bodies. It's really disappointing. <laughs> so we're going to go through a few steps, get you to do a little work. And who knows, who knows, someone may get a topic <laughs> and it will be someone that put their hand up. <laughs> but the first thing, don't panic. <laughs> yeah, who remembers them? What was he doing when he was saying don't panic? <laughs> yeah. So I can tell you not to panic for all I'm worth, and you'll still panic. Because most topics sound like, George, today's topic is Because you heard your name. <laughs> and you went 
they can't possibly have asked me. Why have they asked me? What did I do wrong? You know, was I cruel to a puppy in a previous life? Why is this happening to me? And then you think, oh, I'm supposed to be up there answering this topic. And that's where it goes wrong. You focus so much on not wanting to ask the topic or answer the topic. You focus so much on other stuff that your brain just, I was going to say stops working, but it doesn't stop working. Because if your brain stops working, you die. And we know that doesn't happen at Toastmasters now. <laughs> But it starts to work in an inappropriate fashion. And then things go horribly wrong. So there's a reason why we can change the way that we breathe. Most of us breathing pretty much autonomous. It just goes on, keeps on working. Somebody asks you a topic. <laughs> <laughs> What you do is just stop, stand, and breathe. And it is amazing what that one action does. It lets your brain stop, take a pause, and let you have a think. Now, that should be blindingly obvious, but it's not. It's not. When you're in any kind of panic situation, you just stop thinking. Incidentally, one of those is a male brain and one's a female brain. <laughs> I have no idea which is which. <laughs> but look at the connections in there. And that's just an illustration that somebody did. It's, it's not to scale by any manner of means, but there are neurons firing in your brain at incredible speed. And you've got so many memory cells. And is, is there anybody in here over 40? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't resist that one. <laughs> You've got 40 years of memory. Can you imagine what a computer would be like if you filled that with 40 years of every single thing that you've ever done? It just wouldn't work. But the brain does. But it's got an index system. <coughs> when your brain sees a situation, when somebody gives it information, it just looks at the index cards and it starts to flip through and say, what do I know about this? And you know, every one of you in this room knows something about everything. Because we're inundated with data, with stimuli, all day, every day. You see something on the news, and you might just see the words, <coughs> tangential orbit. <laughs> but we've all seen that somewhere along the lines, and your brain's filtered that. And I wish I hadn't said that, because my brain's now gone and found information on that, and I have a burning desire to tell you all about it. So. Back when the space program started, no, <laughs> we'll go there. But it has to check through the index. Then it has to go and find the first bit of information that it knows about that subject. And then it feeds you that bit of information. <coughs> and then you get it wrong. <laughs> and the reason that you get it wrong is that is what's called fast thinking. Something hits your brain. It goes to the index, it flies through, so the information comes in, the brain encodes it, and it starts the retrieval process. And once that starts, we start to speak. And what we haven't done is we've not given the brain time to get down there. And consequently, we start off and we're so confident. And about 30 seconds later, <laughs> right, who's ever stood there 30 seconds into a topic and thought, I know. <laughs> there are babies bumbling away in cribs. 
that you know more than I do. <laughs> and that's because we just don't give ourselves time. How long did that pause feel like there? Did anybody notice the pause? <laughs> no. Now, yeah, I'm up here for dramatic effect, and you're all sitting there going, yeah, he's fine, he's carrying on, I don't speak there. That pause hurt. Because I'm stood here thinking, how long can I keep that going? And after 25 years in public speaking, the answer to that is still under three seconds. After a three second pause, like, there are spiders clawing <laughs> inside of my brain saying, say something, say something. And the audience sit here and don't even notice the pause. So when you're going to give a topic, pause, think about it. Let it get to your short term memory and then it goes and loops in the long term memory. And in that long term memory, there is a host of information ready to complete your topic. And if I go no cross today with this, and with me, that's always a possibility. <laughs> um, that's enough information for you to answer any topic. Listen to the topics master. If you didn't get the question, ask them to repeat it. I recall an area contest, was it last year? If anybody was at the area contest in Glasgow, when my brain didn't get the topic master's accent, and I asked her repeat, to repeat the topic three times, well, you can't ask any more than that, can you? Because it's embarrassing, it's usually your fault at that point. And yet her accent, my ears, I didn't gel. I got about 70% of what she'd said and went up and answered what I thought the topic was. I didn't win, but that doesn't matter. She had a win that day. <laughs> so, but you take that time, ask for things to be clarified, and once it's clear, stop and think, what did that topic mean? And once you do that, just let the brain freewheel and you will come up with an answer. And 90% of the time, if you allow that answer to percolate just for a couple of seconds, because the brain's really fast, you will get the right answer. But if you're all confident and it's the first thing you think of, you will mess up. <clears throat> and that is what most people do wrong in topics. <clears throat> they start to talk about the first thing that they think of, and then 30 seconds in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how often have we praised a new member or a guest? They've got up, they've given a topic, they hit 40 seconds is about the norm, and then you just see it happening. <laughs> and the sweats, I can talk. Uh, the sweat starts, you can see panic starting to set in. They sit down and the topics evaluator comes along and says, Mary, that was brilliant. Well done. Very few new members make it to the first minute. So if you're making it past the first minute, you're doing well. You do know what's going on. You just need to take that time to think. And if you want to know more about thinking, that book there, is so worth reading, fast and slow thinking. And in that book, he explains in great depth, sometimes more depth than you need because he is an academic, <laughs> uh, about why fast thinking fails and slow thinking is the way to go. And I can make these slides available to anybody that wants them, so, uh, but feel free to write that down. There's some brilliant stories in there. And one example of faulty thinking that he gives really stuck with me. <coughs> he conducted an experiment where he got people to put their hand in a bucket of iced water. Now, 
Who's ever got under the shower, hit the button and the jet of cold water's hit them and they've almost gone through the wall? Yeah, because when it's just, ah. Oh. And I read that having slow showers helps you lose weight. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. It does. I checked it out. The sci it's scientifically proven that taking a cold shower every day can lose you as much as an extra two pounds in a year. <laughs> and I thought, that's not weight loss. <laughs> so, so you can imagine the pain of taking your hand and putting it into a bucket of ice water. And then he goes on to explain that they repeated the experiment, but at the point where they had timed out the previous time, they add some warm water and ask them to keep their hand in for as long as possible. And some went up to a minute longer. And then they said, which experience would you like to repeat? And without exception, they all said the second one. Now think about that. Your hand's in a bucket of ice water. After three minutes, you can take it out. Or you can leave it in for a while longer with water that's not quite so cold. And that's what people chose to do. And that's the sort of faulty thinking that goes in our brains, thinking after three minutes I'll just take that out. The discomfort's gone, but why would it be slightly more uncomfortable for another minute? And it's all about that faulty thinking, and well, very often the first thing that comes to mind is just wrong. So bear that in mind. And the other thing is, more so if you're in a competition for topics, if you do the first thing that comes to mind, chances are everybody else did, and you're all talking about the same thing. Whereas if you just take that extra two seconds to pause and let it percolate, you'll be talking about something different. And because judges are almost human, <laughs> then, <laughs> says as a keen contestant, uh, they'll go, oh, that's different. So you can afford to be a little bit more rubbish than you were going to be in the first place <laughs> if you were talking about something different. Because the human brain loves novelty. It loves new things. And I've been fooling judges for years using that, and now I've given the secret away. But the other thing that happens, which I've mentioned, is when you start off with your first thought, as you hit the wall. And what do you do when you hit that wall? <laughs> Anybody, any thoughts? What do you do when you hit the wall? Start to babble. Sorry? Start to babble. Yes, yeah, start to babble. Anything start else? Start to climb. Start to climb. <laughs> Most people bang their head off it. <laughs> what you do is the one thing you should never do in a topic. And people do it, I've done it myself. Don't change horses midstream, because you, you'll never learn how to do topics if you do that. Because that's what a lot of us do. We get 30, 40 seconds in, you run out of steam, and then you think, oh wait a minute, I do know something else about this but it's unrelated to what you were just talking about. And you carry on, and you can see people in the room sitting going. <laughs> and we just had that, I heard John talking there, that somebody, every topic they get, he ends up talking about a Morris Minor. <laughs> and there are people that do that, because he's got a friend who's Morris Minor obsessed, and his brain's full of little cars. So every time he gives a topic, he ends up talking about Morris Minors. And, we do get off track, and it's so easy to do. So, the one thing that I hate about giving workshops is that at some point, I have to let you do some work, and I have to stop talking, <laughs> which distresses me, because I, I dearly love the sound of my own voice, and I'm really clever and I'm good at everything. And so, unfortunately, I now have to ask you to do a bit of work. And because Safe Haven Conference was so kind to you, you all have a notepad and a pen. 
and you've got what I think is two minutes. That may be completely different to what you think is two minutes. Yeah, okay, I see, I see the emergency paper getting handed out by the sergeant's arms. Those who didn't have paper, your names are noted. And for two minutes, or as I say, what well, I think is two minutes, because it's my show and I really don't care what you think two minutes is. I want you to write down, and we're nearly there, we're nearly there. Sergeant Arms is beavering away there busily. And, and the thing that the thing that I will say about this is that we are all grown-ups. <laughs> and as grown-ups, we should have realised by now that if you don't know the answer, it is absolutely fine to cheat and copy from your neighbour. Because <laughs> that's how we get on in life. We're all sharing. But sometimes that sharing is one way and the other person doesn't know they're sharing. And that's called plagiarism. And I'm really happy for you. If you run out of steam, copy from your neighbours. Because actually, how do we progress in Toastmaster? But to copy from our neighbours. That's the whole point of this organisation. We see good stuff, we imitate it. So if you run out of steam, copy away. Um, but what I want you to do in two minutes approximately is write down as many uses as you can for a brick. <laughs> Incidentally, keeping lifting your head and staring at that brick will not help. <laughs> yeah, those of you that are doing that, it's not helping. I can assure you, it's the same brick. No, it's got in it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's very inspirational. Yeah. near two minutes. So, let's shout out a couple of answers. Make a bookend. A bug hotel. A bug hotel. Absolutely brilliant. Throw it through a window. Yeah. <laughs> Kill a noisy neighbour. Yeah. An air vent. Yeah. Door stopper. Yeah, there's an awful lot of violence going on here. <laughs> Uh, when the handbrake fails in the model smile. Morris Minor up on bricks when you change. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a small presidents who want to make an impressive speech. Yes. Don't Don't yeah. There's a very poor bowling ball. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing how some people's minds work. But look at the differences that you all got in there. Yeah, you could get six pens in it. Possibly more, because there's eight holes. That's not the bit I came in with. Now, what was your first answer that you wrote down? <laughs> yeah, yeah great. a few of you had something different as the first one, but there was a very loud chorus about build something there. And that's why you're always going to be talking about the same thing as everybody else. It's going to be really dull, it's just not going to work. But by the time you got to the end of that list, weren't there some wonderful suggestions there? Mostly violent, admittedly. <laughs> I do worry about where the human brain goes, and maybe next time a brick might not be the best thing to think of. But here's the thing. If we change the context of our thinking, we get different answers. And this is one of the keys to life, the universe, and everything, but more specifically, topics. <laughs> I'm just going to give you a minute this time. And what I want you to do is write down how many ways that you can think of that you could use that brick to improve a football team's performance. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's the minute up. <coughs> so again, what have we got? Weight training. Yep. Weight. weight training. Threaten. Threaten, yeah. <laughs> you, go, you went to violence really quickly, Laura. <laughs> Very quickly indeed. Use the Ventilate the dressing room. Ventilate the dressing room. Post like an age one, something like that. Absolutely. Improve posture. Yeah. Build the wall in front of the goal. Build the wall in front of the goal. I like that. And I post train around. Oh, yeah, you yeah. know what? Swizzle, swizzle. Okay, yeah. Foot warmer. Pardon? <laughs> Who said foot warmer? I did. <laughs> yeah. Offer it as a trophy. Offer it as a trophy, yeah. Do you see. Oh, sorry. Encouraged to count to ten before shouting at the referee. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. If only all footballers would do that, yeah. But do you see how your thinking changed? When you changed, that sounded like a tough challenge that I set there. Who wrote down more than five things? Quite a few people. And that's a really obscure thing to ask somebody to do, is use a brick to help a football team train and get better. But you can do it. It's just about stopping and thinking and letting your brain cope with it. And once you've got there, your brain will fill in the blanks. And the more terrified you are, the better that works. Because you're already adrenaline fueled. Because when you get scared, we all know about the fight or flight response. Well, 
I've yet to see someone get asked a topic and jump out of their chair and run out the door. I mean, I've seen people close, but it's not actually happened yet. So we choose not to flee. Therefore, we've chosen to fight. And I've never seen someone ask a topic go up and punch the topics master. <laughs> it's been close, but I've never seen it happen. Therefore, we've got one option left to use up that adrenaline, and that's to fuel the brain. So if you're, if you're scared, and the other thing, never, never, never walk to the lectern like this. Because <laughs> by the time you get there, you'll have run out of adrenaline. <laughs> <clears throat> Those of you that know me really well know that I am terrified of competing in contests and Toastmasters. It terrifies the life out of me. I could sell the excess adrenaline <laughs> in a contest, but you will always see me walk really smartly up and get on the stage as if I don't have a care in the world. I won the topics contest in Glasgow many years ago, and as I hit the stage, I still had no idea what I was going to talk about. But I trust my brain because it's got me this far. It's been working for in excess of, well, on average, it's probably been working for about 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the 70s, it uh, kind of didn't work the way it should. And I, I don't remember as much in the 70s as I would like. But it gets you through life, it gets you through situations, it deals and copes with all sorts of circumstances. So why would you not trust it to get you through a two-minute topic? It's, it, it's, in, on one level, it seems absurd that we've all gone through exams at school, that we've all had job interviews, we've all been faced with things in the workplace that you couldn't dream of coping with, but we coped. And then somebody says, so what's your favourite season? And we go, oh, I don't know. There's only four choices. It's not difficult. Wow. And most people don't like winter anyway, so we're down to three. And we live in the UK. And it rains in spring all the time, so you're actually, you've got a 50 50 ball there. And to be honest, most of us grump when it gets too hot, so the answer's autumn. <laughs> well, it's not like there's a choice. <laughs> and how many people have said autumn and then went, haven't the autumn colours beautiful? <laughs> the leaves on the trees, and then they start to find me, the, please, you know, pick something unusual. Go for summer and tell people how much you love to lie on the beach and burn yourself to a crisp. And spend the next week in agony watching the skin peel off your body. Uh, and going through five bottles of calamine lotion every day. Is that not more interesting than look at the pretty leaves? It's just that slight switch around. But. I haven't seen that bit before. That was quite good. <laughs> I'll mark that for the camera and I can go back and look at it. Now, <clears throat> time to state the obvious. The granny school for advanced life is sucking. There are things that you can do to enhance the experience of topics. Do these things every time. Exaggerate. Did you notice that little thing there about the sun and the skin peeling off? And not a bottle of calamine lotion, five bottles of calamine lotion. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> I, who heard my stranger on a train speech? Who thinks it was all real? 
Yeah. Uh, just the one. <laughs> there was a lot of exaggeration in there. It was genuinely based on truth. Uh, it was quite an amazing experience. But it was exaggerated. Because if I told you what happened, you'd have went, really? Yeah, that's a bit dull. You've got to exaggerate. You've got to build things up. And then, and I think I said this earlier on, use pauses, but pause till it really hurts, till you think, I, I can't stay silent for another second. Because if you get a laugh from the audience, or a reaction of, as I often do, ooh, <coughs> give it time. Let it sink in and let the brain make the next connection. Who remembers Dr. David Jones that used to be in District 71? Won the district topics five times. And that's not an exaggeration, he won it five times. And he said, when he's giving a topic, he said, it's like, I'm in a lorry and the brakes don't work and it's just hurtling down the road and I'm in the passenger seat and that's what, you're, that's what you should allow your brain to do just let it go and eventually it won't work the first couple of times and that's the bit that people that scares people they think this isn't going to work and then they get up and go oh it was right and it didn't work <laughs> <laughs> yeah but then, the next time you get up and you go, yeah, I didn't think that was going to be working. Yeah, it didn't. But then the third time you get up and go, oh, there's something in this. There's something in just letting my brain free wheel and just go for it. Gestures, big and bold and wild. How many times have you seen people say something like, I went on the holiday of a lifetime. We travelled all around the world. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> and you, you give them feedback and you say, as an evaluator, you said all around the world. You need to be bigger. It needs to be all around the world. <laughs> it doesn't. It needs to be all around the world. It needs to be high and it needs to be low. You need to let yourself go. You need to be huge gestures. And that seems alien in a club setting when you're in a room that you could only just afford and therefore was designed to hold six people. <laughs> and you're stood there and there's somebody just here and you're going, way, way. <laughs> That's not necessarily comfortable. <laughs> It's not comfortable, is it? <laughs> Although it was me, so you were expecting it, I'll give you that. But it's not comfortable doing that. Why do we come to Toastmasters? Comfort zone? Us. Well, it's only just they can get back in really easily. Comfort zone? Us. This is where you want to be if your comfort zone's over there. See, they gave me this stage. <laughs> yeah, at the back you can't even see it. I just look really, really tall. And it was right in the middle of the floor there. And they gave me a lectern for those of you at the back. So, so we just threw them in a the corner. Because you need the space, you need to just let your brain go, but let your body go because there's a brain-body loop. And if you're doing gestures like that, your voice goes up. It's really hard to, hard to say. We went all around the world. <laughs> yeah, that's really difficult to do. You've got to work at that. And your voice will follow your gestures. And then the gestures will follow your voice. And by the time the two minutes are up, There'll be marks on the walls, scuffs on the carpets, and broken light bulbs. And then you know you've given a good topic. <laughs> What's been 
the big thing for you in this workshop this morning? Do you notice how confident I was of getting that response? What was the question put up there? No jokes. Jokes don't work. But humour, relevant humour that makes a point. And there are things that I've done with humour this morning that will stick in everybody's mind. And as John said, I still get people telling me they're terrified of getting into a train toilet <laughs> because that's stuck in people's minds. And <coughs> humour is just amazing. Use superlatives. Don't say, I had a great time. I had a wonderful time. You know, don't say, <coughs> you know, somebody shouted out an answer. They yelled out an answer. Go for superlatives, words that really hit home. And we're about to get a red light soon, so practice. Mentally answer every topic you hear in the club and make sure your answer is different to the one that was given at the time. Every topic, bar none. Address unusual events, everyday things as topics. Like my stranger on a train, but do use an inside voice, right? Don't start practicing out loud in a train. <laughs> people think you're odd. <laughs> you're in toast, Toastmasters, people already think you're odd. <laughs> Don't make it worse. <laughs> but here's a couple of things that terrified topicies tend not to do. Be the topics master, because you then have to think of about 10 topics. And guess what happens when you're thinking about topics? You answer them in your head. And you think, where will this topic go? And hopefully you'll be surprised and it will go somewhere you weren't expecting. Be the topics evaluator. You know that minute in every meeting? Who'd like to take a role at the next meeting? <laughs> Hands up if you want to be Toastmaster. <sighs> topics master. Uh, general evaluator, uh, speaker, uh. <laughs> topics evaluator. Uh, I'm do eight topics. I've got to set. I've got to write all that down. Be the topics evaluator because you're analysing every topic and getting a different viewpoint on it. It's the best thing you can possibly do. And finally. Don't panic, keep calm, and have fun. Now, I've got an amber light, so the red's not far away. Any questions? None. The red light's on. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific, as we expected and certainly lived up to that. I think you, you, we always pick up some interesting things from that, don't we? But the one thing that I picked up is the index cards in your brain. Now, you know what happens when you drop index cards on the floor. That's how my brain is most of the time, I think. I've got the index cards, but they're all muddled up. I'm going to go away and experiment on tangential, tangential orbit. I think I'm going to try and learn a bit more about that. But I think we've learned an awful lot of things today, and I'd like to thank James on your behalf, and let's give him another round of applause. I'd like to thank him with this little gift in recognition for his hard work today. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much for your participation, your intention, your, your attention, and your amazing feedback. Just brilliant. Let's all bail out now and go and get coffee. <laughs>